Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives, and advocates from around the world to meet, network, and forge new scientific collaborations. Okay, um, hello everyone. So uh, I'm going to talk about the biotech industry of longevity, of research on aging, and not the aging of the industry itself, as some were thinking apparently. And I realized the title might be a bit confusing. I was told about that before, um, which is why I actually changed the title yesterday. Okay, so uh, briefly overview of my talk. I'm going to first introduce a bit about biotech industry. Um, <clears throat> then I'm going to come to something we discussed a little bit about yesterday before delving really into the aging biotech industry, namely the history of it, and then talking about the future of it. So um, biotech industry is really a booming industry. You can see here two different slides that both, uh, slides, sorry, two different images that both show the same, namely that the amount of spending on the industry is increasing over the years. Um, if you look at it by far, uh, health is the biggest biotech sector. There are of course other sectors, there is agricultural biotech, there is also um, industrial biotech such as biofuels. But um, in terms of the investments and the number of companies working on it, health is by far uh, for the biggest. If you look revenue-wise, agricultural becomes quite a bit more important with the uh, sales of GMOs. So um, what does the biotech industry, on a, uh, the medical biotech industry do? There are two main things. You have uh, companies focusing on diagnostics, uh, and that includes prognostics and even drug monitoring. I put that all together. And then there is, of course, the therapeutics, that includes devices and drugs. Um, and of course, you have companies working on both. That can also happen. Um, and within therapeutics, you have preventative management and curative types of therapeutics. So um, preventive uh, therapeutics, um, an example will be statin drugs, aspirin against heart disease, prophylactic treatment, such as PrEP treatment against HIV, uh, anti-malarias before you travel to a region where uh, malaria is prevalent. Uh, management, that's really the majority of companies focusing on, on. So that's taking people who are already sick, you are giving them a drug that doesn't cure the, uh, the disease, but just improves the disease, improves the symptoms, uh, slows down the disease a bit. And then there is curative. And curative will be where you give a treatment for a certain period of time and after that the, it's, true, it's uh, completely cured or maybe you have to keep taking the drug but it completely cures the disease. It doesn't have any symptoms, it doesn't have any negative effects. Now from the curative point there are not so many examples actually which is a, a, a really sad uh, thing if you think about it. Uh, I was thinking yesterday and there are really three things I could think about. Antibiotics are curative, that's one of them. The second that is curative, or that m might be considered curative, uh, I shall put a small asterisk against it, that is um, uh, treatments for cancer. They are curative in the sense that, yes, a certain percentage of people will uh, achieve complete remission, but not everyone reaches that stage. Uh, the drugs do fail in a lot of people to work. They, we don't have drugs for all types of cancers uh, currently. So a bit of an asterisk, but yes, cancer treatment. And then there are gen genetic treatments for monogenic diseases. 
And again, very few of those are actually available at the moment. So uh, therapeutics, that's not just drugs, but that includes other things. Uh, cell therapy. Um, these are nanoparticles against cancer. For example, you take a nanoparticle, you inject it, then you irradiate it with, a, with radiation. The nanoparticle is uh, preferably absorbed by the tumor and hence destroys the tumor. Tissue engineering, this is a slide from Alexander Cephalion. So we talked about that in the first day. I'm not going to repeat. Different types of uh, genetics uh, approaches. This includes gene therapy, not just the gene therapy. Also think about antisensor RNA and other types of genetic type of interventions or at the level of oligonucleotides interventions. Bionics, replacing a lost arm. This is apheresis. Uh, some people may not be aware of what apheresis is. Apheresis basically is you take the blood out of a patient, you pump it through a column that absorbs something specifically, and then you pump it back in the patient. Or instead of using a column that absorbs, you can also use a centrifugal type of technique to remove specific blood components. And um, an example of that was mentioned on the first day, and that's against LDL and LPA. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, giving people probiotics, um, uh, and that's uh, also a possible approach. So um, this was already mentioned by the first speaker, Iromslau, which means that the productivity of the pharma industry is decreasing in terms of by, by uh, the same amount of money invested. Uh, the other problem is we have a lot of diseases of aging, and these are just a few of them. And if we are going to tackle each of and every one of them separately, we are going to be busy for a very long time, like a thousand years or so, uh, and that's not really going to work. So what we need to do is we need to intervene in the aging process itself and hence prevent all of these diseases at once. So we already discussed yesterday and we will discuss maybe a little bit more today in the panel session that aging cannot be separated from disease. Aging leads to pathology. Yet, as was already mentioned yesterday, not everyone seems to understand this point. In the scientific literature, um, this was a paper from the 1980s. Uh, sorry, that image is a bit blurred. Um, this is um, uh, an author who writes, and I will read it because you won't be able to read it. It is important to differentiate normal, normal aging from a disease process in the uh, um, elderly and um, then a bit more positive, he continues to say um, that normal aging um, could also be, you know, um, does not mean that you shouldn't use treatment for it. So, you know, that's a bit of a weird statement, but, but okay, it, it, the, the point I wanted to make is basically, he says that you need to differentiate between normal aging and disease. And we said yesterday, no, there is no such difference. This is another example from, the from 1961. Uh, Koronshevsky wrote this book uh, where he differentiates pathological from physiological aging. And of course, you find the same in the popular media, and this is just one blog that I stumbled upon yesterday, and that is, uh, what is the difference between normal aging and Alzheimer's? Well, the only difference is that Alzheimer's is a worse phenotype of what everyone has. Um, an important point uh, is basically what is aging biotech? Um, how are we going to define it? Are we going to say that every company working on some disease of aging, such as these two companies work on Alzheimer's disease, and this company works on osteoarthritis, and of course there are many, many companies on the world working on specific diseases. Are we going to say these are part of the aging biotech industry, or are we going to use the word aging biotech specifically for companies that work from the perspective of aging? Now, I can't really answer it because that's really a subjective question. It's not an objective one. But um, 
you know, I would like, you know, personally to go for these type of companies. I think this is the future and this is the past. So let's talk a bit about aging biomarkers. Here is the definition by the NIH of what a biomarker is. A biomarker is a characteristic that is objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal biological processes, pathogenic processes, or pharmacological response to a therapeutic intervention. Okay? So about aging then, there are many biomarkers that have been uh, claimed to be biomarkers of aging. Uh, some of them include grip strength, cognitive function tests, reaction time, vital capacity. These are the ones that the physician will be measuring uh, at the moment already. Skin autofluorescence, N-glycan profiles, DAHS, telomere length, methylation age, and so on. You know, this was already mentioned earlier. Everyone will have heard about measuring telomere lengths. So here you see DHAS uh, uh, concentrations in the blood, that's a hormone, and they uh, indeed decrease significantly with age. Now, a very important question is, um, does that mean if we do something and these uh, levels will increase, does that then mean that the people will age slower? Because if, you, you know, if we talk about a biomarker of aging and we want to use that to prove that the therapeutic against aging is active, then the biomarker, if, if the biomarker improves, then that, that means that also you know, the aging process must have been slowed, that you must have, you know, uh, have the lifespan extended. And that is for most of these biomarkers, or for almost all of them, it's not established. It's, not, it's, it's proven that they all decrease in age, that there is a correlation with age, but that if you would improve these biomarkers, that that also means that lifespan is improved, that's another question altogether. However, some of these biomarkers have already been marketed. Um, telomere length measurement is done by several companies. Here, just measuring, uh, mentioning two of them. There are also quite a few clinics around the world where you can go and pay, and they will do a whole set of biomarkers for you. Um, for example, the company that I already mentioned, Human Longevity Incorporated, has the Health Nucleus Clinic. And uh, this is a very new one that will be uh, opening in London, the London Geoscience Clinic. So let's go back to the history of aging biotech companies. Uh, I have chosen the name pioneering companies for the companies from the 1980s, 1990s, who were the first companies to start doing investigations in human aging. Uh, Giron, Altion, Altion from Alahibrium Chloride, ALT711, Sierra Sciences, Elixir Pharmaceuticals. Then we had uh, Sirtuis Pharmaceuticals founded in 2004, and in 2008, four years later, it was sold for uh, $720 million. And I believe that uh, this success was an inspiration for a new generation of companies to be founded. Because of course, financial success means that um, venture capital firms will be interested in funding these types of companies. So um, let's talk a little bit about what we need to do um, to change, to cause a paradigm shift in the way we do research. Well, in the past, and um, we had a, a lot of labs working on a single protein, on a single gene. Um, what we need to do in the in, in the future is integrating all this knowledge and work on big data, doing multi-omics approaches and doing them as was already mentioned yesterday in new models such as 3D organoids so that you can actually use human cells. And if we can optimize this, if we can um, create an organoid and grow it in physiological oxygen concentrations and have it in a medium that perfectly mimics what is the conditions in the human body, 
in terms of growth factors. If we can put it in an extracellular matrix that mimics a human extracellular matrix and not just in some collagen gel. And of course, I'm talking now about the long future because there are lots of challenges here. But then we can maybe come up with an organoid that is going to be a better, better model for human disease than just a maris or a C. elegans worm. And then, of course, there is also great challenges in mathematical modeling uh, to be done, um, systems biology and so on. And for people working um, on the biology, I would like to say, but probably those people already know it, that it's very important that we continue to develop new technologies for doing research. In the past, a lot of the greatest discoveries were the result of improvements in methodologies. The discovery of mass spectrometry, CRISPR-Cas, um, fluorescent proteins, and microarrays are some of the examples. So um, let's go back to aging uh, and um, the therapeutics against aging. There is a, a paper that I already mentioned earlier, uh, published just over a month ago in, in the Journal of Gerontology. And in that paper, um, that was a result of the um, R24 Giro Science um, Network um, that uh, last year had a retreat in the UK. And many of the leading people in the field were thinking about how can we move therapeutics to the clinic. And in that paper, they uh, write what differentiates the new thinking on uh, geroscience versus the classical way of uh, treating disease. And that is that we are going after molecular targets that are derived from the aging field itself. So um, you are going after uh, mTOR, for example, because we know from basic biology of aging that mTOR is involved in aging, hence it must lead to many diseases. So this must also affect multiple diseases. And um, we are going for targets that are not a direct risk factor for the disease, but rather that are a direct part of aging. So that's a slide that I used yesterday for the panel session. To illustrate this, we have basic biology. Uh, of aging, and we are going to move that to human treatment. Um, question is exactly how are we going to arrive there? Um, are we going to use uh, animal studies, and which animals will we choose um, to do that? But how about human clinical trials? Are we going to take people who are already old, who are already at high risk for disease, and uh, treat them for a limited period of time? and then observe if that works, if the uh, incidence of disease decreases. For some therapeutics, senolytic drugs, we might be able to see results quite quickly, uh, where treating, treatment for maybe a few weeks may already be able to have an impact, although we might have to wait for a year or, or more before the phenotype becomes visible, but we might only have to treat for a limited period of time. Um, are we going to use biomarkers of aging uh, to, to prove that our treatment is working and so on? Another thing already mentioned yesterday was repurposing old drugs, metformin, aspirin, rapamycin, and of course we had a whole talk yesterday about Tolkapol. And so the benefit of that, as was already mentioned yesterday, is that you can bypass phase one safety trials because these compounds are already approved for human use. So let's take an example of a possible geoprotective treatment in humans, uh, metformin, which probably most of you are aware is my favorite molecule. <laughs> um, metformin meets all of the three requirements that we set forth earlier. Metformin uh, comes from the basic biology of aging. It is an AMPK activator. AMPK inhibits mTOR, and mTOR is one of the most well-known uh, pro-aging proteins in your body. So um, uh, 
metformin also is known to affect multiple diseases. It's of course very famous for the treatment of diabetes and it prevents pre-diabetics from becoming diabetics. But it's also known that it reduces cancer incidence. And metformin may have beneficial effects against other diseases. They are looking into um, neurodegenerative diseases. Although the effect of metformin on neurodegenerative diseases is a bit murky at the moment with some papers seeing benefits, some saying actually it might be a bit harmful. Uh, we are not actually certain about that. Metformin may be beneficial for heart disease, but again, that's not as well established as the other examples. And um, finally, um, the um, third uh, category is that metformin is not acting on a direct risk factor for a specific disease. It's really acting on the aging process. And I'm going to end my talk here with some conclusions. We need more investments in companies working on aging. People must become more focal. And this is probably very important. We will only see a change if people are going to stand up and say, we are tired of the current situation, we want something to be done about aging. Right? Um, and also, um, we demand that the process of getting these trials done in humans becomes simplified. So that's the next point, is simplifying the regulatory process. Um, Alexander Fitzsefalion on the first day already illustrated just how extremely difficult the regulatory process is when you are doing work on humans. And finally, we should go beyond the first do no harm principle. That's a principle that is 2000 years old and it's really a bit outdated. It's outdated in the sense that um, it stops us from doing an intervention that, yes, may be harmful to a limited number of people, uh, but that may potentially cure hundreds of thousands of people. An example will be um, the gene therapy that was done in the bubble point children. So you might remember that more than 10 years ago they did some trials with gene therapy in, in uh, the so-called bubble boy children, which are children born without an immune system. And yes, some of these children got cancer and died. And that stopped uh, clinical progress for over 10 years before anyone dared to do new uh, uh, gene therapy treatments. Um, the problem with that is that in the meantime, millions of people have died that could potentially have been saved if we would have pushed on with gene therapy. Right? We shouldn't be stopping a potential great therapy because one patient died in a trial of thousands of people. But that's what will happen today. Okay. And thank you, that was my lecture and I take questions. Dear Sven, uh, thanks a lot again for inviting me because I'm learning a lot. And thanks for your talk. Uh, I am an MD. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the director of the biggest institute, uh, the National Institute on Aging in Italy, with uh, several hospitals from north to south. So I know the reality of, uh, uh, of the diseases of aging. So I like uh, uh, y y your uh, vision, but I think that we should also emphasize that uh, all these uh, future uh, tools uh, uh, have to be accompanied by uh, a, an empowering of the people of their own health, uh, which means uh, the lifestyle because the, uh, the increase of longevity, which happened in the last uh, uh, 
century was due to hygiene, antibiotic, but mostly uh, of the improvement of uh, lifestyle and uh, the, the two main pillars that uh, MDs now have in their own agenda is nutrition and lifestyle. So I think that uh, to have this vision uh, which is uh, focused on uh, new drugs, new pill, new intervention and so on is okay. But uh, we should not uh, forget that uh, we have to combine this with uh, an empowerment, uh, which is a cultural problem. Uh, and uh, also to, to put attention to nutrition, for example. Nutrition means uh, the, the, the gut microbiota change. So nutrition is much more complicated than classical nutritionists think about. Uh, it's an enormous and very complex field. So I think that this is, and also physical activity has a lot of uh, uh, effect on the brain, on, 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 uh, on the liver and everything. So I think that this, uh, uh, this is also emerging as uh, the future, uh, and I think this uh, should be added to the vision in order to have a more realistic and, uh, uh, and feasible, uh, feasible vision, which is a sort of oxymoron. Okay. That was almost a presentation. <laughs> Sven, uh, can you make the answer a little bit shorter? Okay. So a physician friend of mine told me that during his whole medical career, well, that he had studied, he had received less than an hour of pure nutrition talk. And then, of course, somewhere here and there in the course, they were mentioning, you know, oh, yeah, don't eat too much sugar. Yes, that's it. Right? That, that's, that's the type of nutrition knowledge that physicians have, unless they, of course, study on their own and are interested in the field. But in universities, it's not taught as part of the classical curriculum. And there I would agree with you, that's a big problem. Um, for the general audience, it's going to be more of a problem of there is so much nutrition advice out there that people actually don't understand it anymore. You know, there is so much conflicting evidence out there. There is also so much pseudoscience out there of nutrition that is a real problem because you know people who are not scientists cannot cut through that confusion of different uh, you know, suggestions that they get uh, on, you know, you need to think about your pH of your food, for example, right? And they cannot not understand that that is actually not making any sense.